Hey folks, you remember last year, Sud de France, growing oysters, the helicopter ride I didn't take, water jousting, sea salt production. Well, we're back with another great program filmed in that region. We're going to visit some great markets, some great shops, and finally a visit to an area all the way down by Spain, the Banyuls region. It's one of my favorite wines for pairing with desserts with chocolate. I've never understood quite how it was made, so stay with us. Sud de France, up next. You know, I love food markets, and I've been to this one before. It's a little town called Bizier, and it's typical. I mean, all over Europe you have these markets. It seems like every town has a, an indoor market like this, where you've got a bakery, a couple of restaurants, uh, three or four butchers, a place where they sell dried nuts, fruits, great fish. I'm just sitting in front of a vegetable stand here. Nothing terribly exceptional. It's kind of the end of the summer, so things are good, but not great. But I'm thinking, let's go over and check out some fish. We've eaten some great seafood since we've been down here. So, fish market in Bizier, I remember from the last time I was here, six or seven years ago, was smoking. Let's buy some fish. This reminds me of like a little kind of a, a bunker, kind of an oily kind of a fish with that kind of shell to it. Here you've got fresh sardines. This is skate. That's the smiley side face. That's the side that's down towards the sand and that's what you see facing up. And you know, any fisherman in Long Island, Jersey, these things drive you crazy. But they're great eating. The French eat skate all the time. I love skate. This is a little tiny monkfish. It's really a shame for me to see monkfish this size. You can see the monkfish liver there. It's a beautiful delicacy. But I mean, this is a really, really tiny monkfish. Um, really beyond reproduction stage, or before. This is uh, the same skate that we saw. That's the usable portion of it, pretty small. Here's the monkfish tail. These are little sole. I mean, this is way before reproductive age. So when you're catching fish that big, you don't really have a chance to uh, make baby fish, so if you're eating sole that big, how much longer can you be eating sole? But it's here in the market and they're delicious. This is one of my favorite fish back here, it's Rouget. It's a French fish. Uh, the skin gets very crispy, a little bit fishy, but very, very delicious. It's absolutely one of my favorites. Dorade, which is probably farm-raised, a couple of varieties of Dorade. This is, these, again, these little tiny flatfish, I don't know what they call them, Le Mont Pêché Méditerranéen, little, little flatfish, much smaller Rouget. Again, monkfish tails salmon, that's a tuna loin on the back there. And these, I didn't know what these were. I, w I couldn't read this. S-E-I-C-H-E-S, Sieche -E -E or something they call them here. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of squid that comes from the south of France, from these harbors. It's delicious. It's got a really thick, meaty wall. That's fantastic fish. This is like a classic butcher stand here. We actually have a butcher that's cutting meat. On this side, they've got typical charcuterie, pâtés, saucisson, that sort of thing. I love this stuff here. You've got these really great looking aged saucisson. Every region has its own style. Uh, these are just cured meats in natural casings. There's a couple of types of beef they have here. This is not like American beef. This isn't corn fed beef, so it tends to be much, much leaner. There's French beef, the Italian beef always is because they don't finish theirs on corn. They don't have corn like that. We do. Um, so this is typically grass fed and much, much leaner. You can see that in the cuts of meat. This is a, a piece of the style of beef called limousine. It's either usually Charolais or Limousine in France. And these are these little cuts that the butcher pulls out. I think that might be a plow or a spider. These are little cuts that these butchers find in the mussels that they only sell here because they really take the meat apart because it's much more expensive than in America. All right, we're here in the middle of Bizier, and this is kind of a, a great pleasure. Andy Ravel is my guest for this little moment. Anne's great because she was basically born and raised here and then had a whole career, 25 plus years, in New York, you were working for the New York Times, uh, early days of the TV Food Network, you're really in the food world in New York, and then in the last couple of years, you're back. So you're in this kind of great position to bridge both worlds for me. You know, uh, you certainly have a New York sensibility that you, you'll never get rid of, but you're from here and now you're back. Talk to us about this region, because again, I, uh, this is one of these parts of France Americans don't know, the whole Languedoc-Roussillon. Talk a bit about your experience as someone that can, has been on both sides of the Atlantic. Well, for, um, I think Languedoc, uh, the reason uh, people don't know Languedoc uh, as well as, let's say, Provence is uh, it's not a, a glamorous uh, region. It's an authentic region mm. that hasn't been touched um, so much um, by um, the moder modern culture. And so you have uh, all sorts of contrasts here. You have um, the sea and but you also have the mountain where people uh, live uh, the way they lived 100 years ago and um, and 
they, are, they stay unfazed by what's going on around here. And that's this con constant uh, contrast between uh, old and new. When I think of the classic dessert pairings for chocolate, the major recommendation I always get in restaurants is the wine banyuls, that's B-A-N-Y-U-L-S. And I've always been intrigued by this wine because it's a very oddball wine. Small production, where does it come from? Works beautifully with chocolate. It's one of very few wines that has that quality. So what do I do? I'm here in southern France visiting this place. It's near Perpignan. We're right on the water. I had no idea that's where this place was. I can't believe they're growing vines here because the, the ground is like solid rock. These, the, the, the vines have to really search for moisture. It's bone dry. It's all like shale and slate and it just drops off into the ocean. We're going to find out how they make this dessert wine because it's really, really interesting. Sommeliers recommend it all the time. I've been intrigued. We're up here in the vineyards. Let's talk to some of the people that make this wine and this is where it comes from. Tell me a, a bit about the history of banyuls and about how it's made. Yeah, the special thing about banyuls is that it's aged outside with the sun, the wind, and the wine stays here for three, five to ten years sometimes for the best ones, and then it's bottled. And with this uh, aging outside, we gather aromas of uh, uh, tobacco, cacao, um, chocolate, it's, uh, it's very tasty, very fruity, it's hot. It's a good, very good natural wine. This is a dry type, Bagnus Grand Cru. Mm. Six years of aging. Six years on wood? Yes, on the wood you've seen before. We like to call the dry Bagnus like conversation wines, library wines. You sit, you have a book, a cigar, and you drink. Mm. Mm. It's a sweet type. Yeah, and this I'm, I'm, I'm automatically thinking of chocolate yeah. and dessert. Yes. Perfect. Because the flavors just line up. Mm -hmm. It's like they just fit together. Chocolate, all the, you know, the, a good chocolate dessert and this yes. is perfect. What an education. What, you know, it's the last day of like four and a half days of filming. I'm like, okay, what's on the agenda today? Bonnils, whatever. Fall asleep in the back of the car, wake up, the ocean, <laughs> the cliffs, <laughs> and then this, and then those casks. Thanks so much. Bart for having us. Thank you for coming, Mike. We'll come see you in New York. Yep. Next week. I will be there. All right. Thank you. All right. <sighs> Signing off from Bonniels. All in a day's work. Big lunch. Getting ready for dinner. Salut. We're here in Narbonne, outside this beautiful market, Léal, of course, the French call it. It's really one of the nicest indoor markets I've seen in France. Uh, Lyon's got a beautiful market. There's other good markets, but this is a stunning one. The building goes back to the turn of the last century, 1900, and was designed by the same people that built the Eiffel Tower, the idea of using uh, uh, reinforced steel like this. It's beautiful, the food inside's great. Lionel Giraud is the chef, one-star Michelin chef here in town, young guy, fantastic cook. Who better to show me the inside of the market and walk around and talk about the products but Lionel. Lionel, thanks for meeting us here today. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Let's go in and shop. All right. okay. <laughs> you know, organics have taken hold in America in a huge way. It's a big part of the movement. It's part of the growth of the movement everywhere. And here in the one corner of the market is just devoted to organic biodynamic uh, farming, wines, ingredients, cheese, and meat. So what's happening in America is happening in France, too. Beautiful celery root grown without pesticides. Lionel uses a lot of these. This is pretty unique. I was told about this by people in the region. The name of this little stand is called Chez Babette. And what you do is you can buy products here, raw. You bring them over to Chez Babette, and they cook them for you. Yeah, I don't know if we have anything like this in America. Buy the ingredients from the market, bring it over, they cook it on the plancha. They got a little fry later. That's fast food in France, huh? You know, the French love their cheese. What did Winston Churchill say? Any country that has 365 kinds of cheeses can't be all bad. Well, this is an air, this is, they might have 365 kinds of cheeses right here. An incredible cheese stall, the best in the market without a doubt, specializing in cheeses from the region. And one of those, when you think of chèvre, goat cheese, you think immediately Loire Valley. It's true, they have a lot in the Loire Valley. Here, the same thing. I was amazed at the goat cheese we've been eating all this time, and this entire selection and around the corner is chèvre. <laughs> You'll 
see with the way he's cutting these hams is by hand. Two reasons. One, you get a very, very fine cut. Secondly, because the by not using an electric motor, you slow the blade down and you get no heat. So you're not cooking the ham at all. So it's a raw ham, the blade moves very slowly, makes a very clean cut, no heat, ham stays raw. Too much heat, you're actually cooking the ham. That's why they have manual cutters. That's why they still use them today. Boudinois, which is traditional sausage. This is just made. Of course, its color comes from the fact that it's uh, made with blood. This is warm, fresh. It's hot. Beautiful. It's an acquired taste. I happen to love it. Thank you. This is uh, some uh, some pate. Yes. Smell the liver. Mm. Mm. Uh -huh. mm. So, so what you were saying is this is you know this these ingredients represent they're all local. The passion of the fishermen, of the cheesemakers, of the bakers, of the, the butchers. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's standing around us here. Yeah. I mean, we came here with Lionel to do a little walk around and it turned into a party. <laughs> this is all these great people with real generosity, with wonderful, real, you know, honest generosity, wonderful products. A wonderful life, and uh, thanks for inviting me to the party. C'est ça le sud de France. Yeah, <laughs> this is it, the sud de France. <laughs> Welcome back from the sud de France. Uh, you know, I love going to these places. Everybody knows, everybody goes to Paris, everybody goes to the same, like, the usual short list of, uh, of places in France. But sud de France is great, we've been a bunch of times. Um, and it really runs geographically, it's big. It's like five or six regions sort of glommed into one. It almost starts right by Barcelona. Um, Perpignan down in that south area where the food's almost Basque style. Lots of seafood all the way up the coast of Montpellier, runs up into the Pyrenees. The wines are wines from the north side that look like Cotteron varietals, down through Picpoul and Montpellier, down to the Banyuls in the south. And the food varies because it's so many, you know, it's coastline, it's inland. So anyway, I brought a chef with me. Thanks for coming on board. He speaks no English. Bonjour. Bonjour. Ah, so, so far we're doing well. Um, Jean-Marc Boyer, Le Puy de Tresseur, which means the treasure in the well. He's got a restaurant in the south. And he's here doing some cooking in New York City, so I grabbed him. I said, you do the demo. And the dish he's going to make today kind of speaks to his style, speaks to the region. It's a navarin of lobster. When you think of navarin, you think usually of lamb. It's a classical dish. It's in the haute cuisine, you know, Escoffier. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a lamb stew. But now we're going to get that same dish and reinterpret it using lobster as the protein and the sauce that's based on that. So we have our ingredients assembled in front of us. Typical ingredients from the soup, right? Oui. Yeah. So we had the vegetables, you saw what was in there. We're just starting to sweat them out. We have olive oil in the pan, of course, good olive oil. This is a lobster. The bodies, the carcasses, the flavor. And like most cooking, at some point, there's water involved. So bay leaf, rosemary, sage, these are big, strong herbs. So with this kind of lobster stock, the entire cooking time is about uh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes for the extraction. It doesn't cook it any longer. To this, he likes to add a little bit of um, tomato product uh, for its acidity, for its color. Acids have a way of sort of balancing flavors, and they polish in flavors, and tomato is a great way to get sort of acid, body, color, flavor, and texture into this, so it's part of it as well. You know, one of the things when you're making any kind of stock, whether it's beef stock, chicken stock, fish fumet, even this lobster stocks at home, is when it comes to its first simmer, to skim off the top. There's always this sort of protein foam. There's always these little uh, imperfections that uh, are going to come up from the lobster body, from the protein that's still on the, on the meat, that's going to make your sauce cloudy. It's going to make it like a, a gravy, and you don't want that. If, you're a, if you want really fine, clear, shiny, perfect broths, skim that first boil off the top. All right, we're taking some of the lobster stock, a little bit of it, and we're passing it through a sieve here. And you know, he, we, you can see with the spoon, he's working, kind of crushing those shells. There's a lot of liquid, a lot of sauce, a lot of flavor, basically, that gets stuck up in those bones and those little spiny legs. And 
So we're just going to chemise. The, we're going we're gonna to coat a little bit the pan with a little bit of butter, not because we're not really sautéing here, but what the butter's doing is what butter always does, with what lipids do best. It, it adds flavor. And uh, now we've got the raw, raw potatoes with the raw garlic, a little bit of butter, just a little bit of butter on the pan, a little coating, and our lobster broth. And the chef loves the idea that the butter kind of helps to marry and enhance the, f the flavor of the lobster stock with the potato. So here we have, this is a, kind of a nice medium boil. We have a lid on the pan. We've added some more butter. If you think about this dish, the potatoes are part of the garniture. They're the starch in the Navarin. And in a lot of places, they would just cook these potatoes separately in water, because that's how people do things. And then when the potatoes are ready and this dish is ready, they disassemble everything. But by cooking these potatoes in this lobster stock, you're infusing the flavor of the protein into the starch from the beginning. So it's a great way to just build layers of flavors and guarantee every bite, everything on your fork is going to be linked by flavor and nothing was wasted. So it's good. He knows. So, so we, what we do is we've, we've reduced the liquid down. So this is this, it, it, now that we have this really concentrated lobster stock, the potatoes are, you can see almost a little risole. They've picked up a little bit of color. We've added a little bit of more lobster stock. The potatoes are done. The potato part's complete. And they're going to taste like little potato lobster bombs. So now we're, <laughs> we're having fun. We're cleaning the lobster. We cook the lobster, boil it a little, you know, uh, salted water. And um, we're going to crack the claw a little bit. Then we take the little, we took this little joint off. Perfect. Pull the lobster out. Cutting the tail into little segments. All right, now the fat that he's putting in the pan is this. As I said, this is a butter. It's completely favored with lobsters. And you do this by, by roasting lobster shells off, by getting all this color, and then adding to that roast lobster body nothing but butter, pounds and pounds and pounds of butter in a big casserole. And then you put, you put the rondeau in the oven. You turn it to 350, because water boils at, at 212. And over the course of a couple of hours, all of the water, you can see the bubbles rising. And when you first do this, there's lots of bubbles rising. As the water is cooking out of the, out of the butter, you notice the bubbles are very small. And then, then you have to take it out, or you burn the butter. So what you have is, is just the butter with no water, just butter fat, not browned and full of lobster flavor. It's just, it's, I can't tell you how huge the flavor is. And we're going to heat the lobster, uh, cooked lobster medallions in this lobster butter. You can see where he's going. It's just layers and layers of flavor. The, the, the garlic was cooked the exact same way as we did the, uh, as we did the potatoes. So just some nice slow poached with butter and lobster stock. <laughs> Yeah, see, we're kind of doing a little poilé. So that's just a little bit of brandy. Now back with the lobster stock. So all that flavor, all that great lobster butter got even better because we cooked more lobster with it. Now we've got lobster stock and then the fond de volaille. And again, he likes the idea, too, of this sort of marriage of, uh, of ocean and land flavor-wise of uh, chicken stock with the lobster stock. And you see seafood restaurants will use, like Bernadin in New York City uses a fair amount of chicken stock too in their sauces because there's a real sort of synergy of flavors. It doesn't, it, it, it pairs well with, uh, with seafood and doesn't stand out. So chicken stock's used a lot. And as this reduces, we're going to mount it with a little bit more butter. And the butter's doing two things. Butter always adds silky smoothness and mouthfeel, but it also thickens. When you finish a sauce like this with butter, it actually gives it more uh, lié. Exactly. Yeah. Tastes great, it, it gives it a little bit of thickness. We're not using flour, we're not using cream, we're not using roux, we're using butter. Yeah, the potatoes. Compose ici avec harmony. Smells great already. Just smells like lobster and herbs and, and butter, not surprisingly. Yeah, this garlic's so delicious to eat, you know, because it's cooked down in lobster and butter, so you kind of get the idea. And look at the richness of this sauce. On a même petit peu comme ça sur les homards. It's beautifully reduced. You can see the butter bound it. That's beautiful. 
you know, you get, you get this, this idea. So Jean-Marc Boyer comes and uh, loves, he's got a one-star restaurant. We'll give it in Lower Thirds somewhere in TV land. We're going to lay the Lower Thirds, the address of, uh, of his restaurant, the name of his restaurant in France. So he has a beautiful one-star Michelin restaurant and a little brasserie or kind of a big brasserie that's attached to it, a comptoir that's sort of more tourist but still fantastic. But this is a beautiful dish. I mean, it smells exactly like everything that went into it. You can smell the rosemary that he's garnishing it with. The lobster is cooked. You saw it twice, but beautifully, again, poached in the broth. The potatoes are going to taste like lobster, the garlic, all on one plate. I'm going to get a fork and eat. <laughs> We're on camera, man. I have to take a bite. I have to, because I do this on camera. It's insane. It's just so, you know, when you eat the restaurants, you get these flavors that are so concentrated and so extracted, and you go home and you make the lobster and you say, it doesn't taste like that. That's why. So this lobster was cooked in lobster butter, in lobster stock. It was braised, and then that stock was reduced down. It's just full of lobster. The place just screams lobster. Sud de France, if you haven't been, go. What are you waiting for? You fly from Paris to Toulouse. You can fly to Paris and take a train to Toulouse. You can rent a car. Go to Sud de France. Beautiful cuisine, wonderful wines, the biggest biodynamic organic wine producing region in France. Easy. Slams them all. Uh, great people, great hospitality, and chefs like him, Je Marc. Merci. 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 I can't wait for my next trip. See you next week. Experience the Mediterranean lifestyle with Sud de France, enjoying wine and food from Languedoc-Roussillon.